<laughs> the Ladies Auxiliary of the uh, Rochester Chesterton Society will now present a spectacle of my wife, in which, in which my wife introduces the next speaker. <laughs> Please welcome Jean Horvath. I don't know if I can read with one hand. <laughs> First, a little poem, a warm-up poem, by John Gardner. The house mouse lives upon crackers and cheese. The church mouse lives on Ecclesiastes. The house mouse's life is all song and laughter. The church mouse will gather his crackers hereafter. <laughs> An introduction to our next speaker would not be complete without first saying some words in memory and appreciation of someone who isn't here. The Horvath spent a lot of time crying. <laughs> when Lou was considering starting a local Chesterton Society at the end of 1999, and nearly every inquiry he was told that he should talk to David Higby. They met, David supported the idea, armed Lou with some names, and here we are. David was the founder and director of St. Irenaeus Ministries. He was a renowned scripture scholar and teacher and also spoke at four of our conferences. David had a mission, and with tenacity he kept that mission before him. Make disciples for Christ, teach scripture, and build true Christian community. To know him was to get a glimpse into St. Paul with a little John Wayne thrown in. <laughs> David Higby, our good friend and brother in Christ, and the mentor, teacher, and spiritual father to our next speaker, was born into eternal life on Christmas Eve 2019 in the hour of mercy. He had fought the good fight. He had kept the faith. For the past year, Irenaeus has been gathering the fruits of his labors. A tremendous number of young people have been passing through the doors of Irenaeus as if they were falling off the tree in front and landing on the front porch. Some inquiring about the Catholic faith, some converting, some reverting. All of their stories are unique and wonderful. The cavalry is coming. It's just that many of them were in sixth grade 10 years ago. <laughs> They're on fire with love for Christ and want to tell others about it. The person they are going to is the current director of St. Irenaeus Ministries and our next speaker. After graduating from college, Ted studied with David, learning history, scripture, Greek, old movies, how to make bourbon beef and Scottish eggs, drink bourbon, and smoke cigars. He did take two years to get a master's in biblical studies from Notre Dame University, along with studying Greek and Hebrew, and did not go to one football game. <laughs> Ted is an, <laughs> an accomplishment. <laughs> Ted is an ex excellent scripture teacher in his own right and spent his lockdown time making YouTube videos and biblical translations that have gained notice far and wide. In fact, he just finished one, an introduction to patristic exegesis. I know. <laughs> I thought this was a, a fitting comment um, he got after it was posted. <laughs> Greetings from Wyoming. Thank you for putting your knowledge and love into these videos. It's not often I can catch a 40 minute plus video and enjoy every minute, but yours I can. Please keep these coming. You're using your talents to serve God by teaching the Christian community. He is teaching scripture. He is helping make disciples for Christ. He is helping to build Christian community, and he is helping our neighbor, his neighbor, corral their chickens when they escape. <laughs> Please warmly welcome Ted Janiszewski.
God is a poet, and the Book of Psalms, his finest work. What I'd like to do here this morning is introduce you to a couple friends and guides who knew how to read the Psalms. And those friends are, let's see here, who? Yep. C.S. Lewis and St. Augustine. And of course, that's uh, Lewis on the right. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. All right. The reason this is important is that if you are able to read the book of Psalms with understanding and have the joy of it, these poems will change your life. That's why God wrote them. I'd like to start with a consideration of the Psalms as poetry. But before we get into what the poetry of the Psalter is, I want to talk about what it's for. And I'll give the first word to Lewis. And here I quote from his charming little book, Reflections on the Psalms. It seems to me appropriate, almost inevitable, that when that great imagination, which in the beginning, for its own delight, and for the delight of men and angels, and in their proper mode of beasts, had invented and formed the whole world of nature, submitted to express itself in human speech, that speech should sometimes be poetry. For poetry, too, is a little incarnation, giving body to what had before been invisible and inaudible. I don't think what Lewis has said here is an overstatement. The second person of the Trinity is called the Word of God, the Divine Logos. The Incarnation was when that Word, that Word of Love, became manifest in the world in a physical body. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Poetry is like that. It is words spoken to give body to what you hold within yourself. Again, Lewis, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. Our love, our delight, even our anger and, and sorrow are somehow incomplete until they become incarnate in words. And so we are incomplete. I would suggest that this is part of what God had in mind in giving us the Psalter. Because God doesn't just want to save your soul. He wants to make you human. But how? How does God teach us to be human? by modeling a complete and integrated humanity in the Psalms and inviting us to make these words our own. Listen to how Augustine describes the proper reading of the Psalms. If the Psalm prays, you pray. If it laments, you lament. If it rejoices, you rejoice. If it hopes, you hope. If it fears, you fear. Everything written here is a mirror for us. The Psalms as a mirror. It's as though we're actors, reading lines in front of a mirror, trying to learn a part. What part? We're trying to learn how to act like human beings. Which is tough, because we've let ourselves become less than human. Our humanity is wounded. We do not feel as we ought. And so God invites us in the Psalter to come before him with true rejoicing, and with grief, and hurt, and yes, even rage. He gives us words to express rightly these motions of the soul. He has written us an instruction manual on what human feeling is supposed to look like. There's a famous section in Mere Christianity on this. Lewis writes, What is the good of pretending to be what you are not? Well, even on the human level, you know, there are two kinds of pretending. There's a bad kind where the pretense is there instead of the real thing. 
as when a man is pretends he's going to help you instead of really helping you. But there is also a good kind where the pretense leads up to the real thing. The Psalter is a mirror for us to practice in front of until we master the art of being human. You might say that the Psalter is God's master class in humanity. So that's what the poetry of the Psalter is for. Next, I'd like to consider whom the poetry is for. We are living in a stunted age. Unlike every other age of man, both civilized and uncivilized, poetry today is the preserve of the elite. It is studied in the ivory towers of academe. You might take a course on Sylvia Plath at Williams or Amherst for 60 grand a year. <laughs> you might read Maya Angelou at book club in your gated community. But that today is the extent of it. The only poetry most people living today will hear is rap music. But in every other age, poetry has been the property of the common man. And the common man is precisely for whom the book of Psalms was written. Witness Augustine. Imagine a voice resounding, Tully's perhaps. Some book of Cicero is read, or a dialogue, one of his, or one of Plato's, or some other great writer. Uneducated folk hear it, people of limited understanding. Who among them is bold enough to aspire to such works? These books are like crashing, turbulent waters, or at least like water flowing so dangerously that a timid animal dare not approach to drink. But when we hear, in the beginning, God made heaven and earth. Is there anyone who is too shy to drink? Is there anyone who hears a psalm ring out and says, that is above my head? Take the strains of our present psalm, for instance. They conceal mysteries, to be sure. But so sweet are they that even children delight to listen to them. The unskilled approach to drink and being satisfied they burst out into psalmody. The people for whom the Psalter was written would have heard these songs of David, sung at the temple, at the major pilgrim feasts. And for them, poetry was part of a life well lived. There was nothing artificial, nothing affected in their enjoyment of the sacred words. They were not reading poetry to be seen by other sophisticated people. They were belting out the songs of their people, of their history, because their hearts were full. What would it have been like to be amid the festal throng going up to Jerusalem in the reign of King Uzziah? Lewis attempts an answer. We get nearest to their state of mind if we think of a pious modern farm laborer at church on Christmas Day, or at the harvest Thanksgiving, we would do him wrong by asking him to separate out, at such moments, some exclusively religious element in his mind from all the rest, from his hearty social pleasure in a corporate act, his enjoyment of the hymns and the crowd, his memory of other such services since childhood, his well-earned anticipation of rest after harvest, or Christmas dinner after church. They are all one in his mind. This would have been even truer of any ancient man, and especially of an ancient Jew. He was a peasant, very close to the soil. He had never heard of music, or festivity, or agriculture as things separate from religion, nor of religion as something separate from them. Life was one. I think we can learn from this picture something of how poetry ought to fit into our own lives. We must aspire to read the Psalter not as aesthetes or literary critics, but as men and women. In the words of Lewis, the most valuable thing in the Psalms, to me, is to express that same delight in God which made David dance. 
it stands out as something astonishingly robust, virile, and spontaneous, something may, we may regard with an innocent envy and may hope to be infected by as we read. Now that we've considered what poetry is for and whom it is for, I think we're ready to ask what poetry is, at least poetry as we find it in the Psalms. Poetry has got to do with the texture of the language. It's not just what the poet says that's of interest, but also how he says it. So for instance, Psalm 133. That is poetry. Could I get a quick show of hands? Who, who, who doesn't know Hebrew? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, all right let, let's switch gears. Uh, there are poetic forms in the Psalter, like, like meter and alliteration, that you can only appreciate from the original Hebrew text, obviously, like all, all poetry, like Dante, right? But these are not the major poetic form of the Psalter. In the words of Lewis, parallelism is the characteristically Hebrew form of poetry. Parallelism is when two lines of a poem balance each other out, kind of an, an echoing effect, call and response, uh, antiphon. And it's interesting, Lewis doesn't illustrate parallelism with a quote from the Psalms, which he, he could have done by quoting from almost any Psalm in the Psalter. Rather, Lewis quotes from the teaching of our Lord, Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. That is parallelism. But where did our Lord, where did our Lord learn to speak like this? Lewis has an intriguing suggestion. <clears throat> In becoming man, he bowed his neck beneath the sweet yoke of a heredity and early environment. Humanly speaking, he would have learned this style, if from no one else, but it was all about him, from his mother. And if you read the Magnificat, what poetic form do you think we find? Would you like to say this responsorially? He has shown the strength of his arm. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones. He has filled the hungry with good things. Our Lady was a poet. But did you notice that I haven't given you the Greek here of Luke's Gospel, let alone any, any Hebrew? But you can still see the poetry, can't you? Lewis actually remarks on this. It is, according to one's point of view, either a wonderful piece of luck or a wise provision of God's that poetry, which was to be turned into all languages, should have as its chief formal characteristic one that does not disappear as mere meter does in translation. Now, speaking of translation, I'd like to say a word about English translations of the Psalter. Uh, Augustine can't exactly help us with that. Um, but C.S. Lewis was an Englishman. What translation of the Book of Psalms did Lewis use? I have worked in the main from the translation which Anglicans find in their prayer book, that of Coverdale. Even of the old translators, he is by no means the most accurate. And of course, a sound modern scholar has more Hebrew in his little finger than poor Coverdale had in his whole body. But in beauty, in poetry, he and St. Jerome, the great Latin translator, are beyond all whom I know. So we all know that the classic translation of the Bible, uh, which was used almost exclusively for centuries across the English-speaking world and gave shape to the English language as we know it, is the King James Version. But it's an interesting fact that in England, at least, the King James Version Psalter never really caught on. 
Because if you want to pray the Psalms, why would you open up your Bible when you've already got them right there in your Book of Common Prayer? And the translation of the Psalms printed in the Book of Common Prayer is that of Coverdale. Coverdale's is the classic English translation of the Psalter, not the KJV. So I've got in my hand here um, a revision of the Coverdale Psalter that was published in the early 1960s. Uh, not a lot of people know about this, but I think you're going to be interested um, when you see who worked on it. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, okay, all right. See? Any of these names stick out to you? Right? D. Winton Thomas, <laughs> Regius Professor of Hebrew at Cambridge, the greatest Assyriologist of the 20th century. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what you're... <laughs> oh yeah, also, C.S. Lewis and T.S. Eliot worked, they sat on committee for this revision of the Cover Coverdale Psalter. And that's noteworthy in part because Lewis and Eliot had really despised each other since at least the 1920s. For instance, you're probably familiar with the opening lines to T.S. Eliot's first poem, Proof Rock. Let us go then, you and I. The evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Ether's a, an anesthesia, right? It's quite an image. C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis wrote a rejoinder in his poem, A Confession. I am so coarse the things po the poets see are obstinately invisible to me. For 20 years I've stared my level best to see if evening, any evening, <laughs> would suggest a patient etherized upon a table in vain. I simply wasn't able. <laughs> Lewis championed the cause of the classic poets from the 16th century to the Romantics whose poetry had helped lead him to Christ. T.S. Eliot, on the other hand, served as figurehead for a time of the modernist movement, the young Turks who were reinventing the English poem. In Lewis's view, uh, in fact, this is an actual quote, T.S. Eliot is the single man who sums up the thing I am fighting against. <laughs> There's a funny story. Um, Lewis and Eliot actually had a mutual friend in the inkling novelist Charles Williams. And Williams knew they hated each other. And so decided it would be fun to invite them both to lunch. <laughs> and so at their famous luncheon in 1945, Eliot walked up to Lewis and said, Mr. Lewis, you are a much older man than you appear in photographs. <laughs> it didn't go well. <laughs> the atmosphere was somewhat chilly around their table. And there was Charles Williams, positively luxuriating in the awkwardness. <laughs> we all need friends like that. It wasn't until Lewis and Eliot were asked to sit on committee together for this, this revision of the Psalter that their relationship finally began to thaw. By the end of their lives, they had actually become friends. We have a number of Lewis's letters where he addresses his fellow poet, my dear Eliot. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. when to read the Psalms. Next, I'd like to take on the question of when. We've talked about what for, we've talked about what is. We talked about for whom. When to read the Psalms, because tastes vary. We're all going to leave this conference wanting to work poetry into our lives, but some will feel drawn to one style, some to another, that's only natural. But there's one body of poetry all Christians should have as part of their daily routine, and that is the Psalter. So when to read the Psalms? 
There have been a number of answers to this question down through the years. For instance, uh, the Desert Fathers in Egypt used to pray the entire Psalter every day, which, while certainly possible, uh, doesn't leave time to do much else. <laughs> the Benedictines pray the Psalter through each week, as did all our priests, uh, actually in the, in the old breviary. The Coverdale Psalter in, um, in the prayer book actually has a monthly reading schedule baked into it. Uh, you can see there, <clears throat> you just start at Psalm 1 at the beginning of each month, and you stick in a bookmark and you read through till you get to the next heading. It's, really, it's, it's right there in the text. My own plan of choice is the seven-week cycle, sorry, <clears throat> that uh, the ordinariate actually prints um, and lays out in Divine Worship Daily Office. That's, that's about a right rhythm for me. It's, it's enough psalms morning and evening that you know that you've prayed the Psalter, but it's not so much that, uh, you know, it becomes uh, onerous or difficult. But there's one plan for reading the Psalter that I regret I cannot recommend, and that is the one you find in the Liturgy of the Hours. If you pray the Liturgy of the Hours, you are missing three entire psalms and verses from 20 others. These were intentionally taken out because, and I quote, because of their curses. So the Catholic Church no longer prays all the Psalms of David because we're embarrassed by them. And this is a sin that cries out to heaven for vengeance. Frankly, I'm, I'm embarrassed uh, that this has been allowed to continue so long. And I think the reason the revisers of our liturgy thought they needed to bolderize the Psalter is that they were never taught how to read it. So I'd like to move on from introductory matters and consider a question that I think might take us a long way toward being able to read the entire Psalter. That question is, who is the psalmist? It is traditional to start a discussion of the Psalter's authorship and provenance with a a vague gesture toward David, followed by some hemming and hawing about the Laman proposition in the psalm titles. But I would like to start instead in Acts chapter 1. And I'm talking about when St. Peter stands up before the church, which then numbered 120 persons, and proposes that they replace Judas with another man to fill out the number of the twelve. And the reason Peter gives is as follows. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and his office let another take. Incidentally, we read neither of these verses in the Liturgy of the Hours. In fact, Psalm 109 is excised entirely. I'm a little bitter. Uh, <laughs> But that's not the reason Peter's argument is so poorly understood today. I've actually heard claims that Peter was in error here. Uh, that he was twisting the scriptures to suit his agenda. But none of the 120 Christians who were there complained. Um, to them, Peter's argument was pellucid. Because they knew something that we have forgotten. Who is the psalmist? We know that David wrote the Psalms, or at least most of them, but it is clear, it is irrefutable from scripture and tradition that the real psalmist is not David, nor Asaph, nor the sons of Korah, the poet, the hero, the protagonist of the Psalter is Christ. Let me tag in Lewis to advance an argument here. We can be pretty sure from the words on the cross that our Lord identified himself with the sufferer in Psalm 22, or when he asked how Christ could be both David's son and David's Lord, he clearly identified Christ, and therefore himself, with the my Lord of Psalm 110. In a certain sense, our Lord's interpretation of the Psalms was common ground between himself and his opponents. The question we mentioned a moment ago, how David can call Christ 
my lord, would lose its point unless it were addressed to those who took it for granted that the my lord referred to in Psalm 110 was the Messiah, the regal and anointed deliverer who would subject the world to Israel. So everyone in the New Testament, our Lord, his disciples, his opponents, everyone knew that the psalmist is the Christ. Even the devil knew. When he tempts our Lord in the wilderness, he recites for him from Psalm 91. He will give his angels charge of you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Who is the you here? Christ. The devil knew that. The only people who don't know are us moderns. Turning back to Peter, why does he feel bold to quote the book of Psalms in support of his decision to fill Judas's vacancy in the Apostolic College? Because there is another figure in the Psalter besides the psalmist. There is the psalmist's betrayer. For instance, Psalm 55, it is not an enemy who taunts me that I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from, them, from him. But it is you, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. So if Christ is the protagonist of the Psalter, the poet hero, then who is his betrayer? As Peter says, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who arrested Jesus. Judas is prophesied in the Psalter. He's the betrayer of the psalmist, the Christ. Peter is merely re-echoing the teaching of his Lord and Master, who actually says in the high priestly prayer, none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. This is just classic. It's staring up at you from the page. Judas is the betrayer who is foretold in the Psalms. And so what do you do when his habitation becomes desolate? His office let another take. It's simple. So how to apply this understanding and read the Psalms aright? Our chief ally in this endeavor is going to be St. Augustine. Augustine is known for three great works. First, the Confessions, his spiritual autobiography. Second, the De Trinitate, a book-length voyage into the mystery of the Trinity. And third, the City of God, his theology of history that forged in one text the thought world of the Middle Ages. But the heart of St. Augustine's spirituality was the Psalter. There's a famous passage in Book 9 of the Confessions, right after his conversion under the fig tree, when Augustine learns to read the Psalms as a Christian. What cries did I give forth to thee, O my God, when I read the Psalms of David, those canticles of the faith, those songs of piety, which admit of no pride of spirit? What cries I used to utter while saying those psalms, and how I was fired by them with love for thee. I burned to recite them, if I could, throughout the whole world against the pride of mankind. And of course, they are sung, they are sung throughout the world, and there is no one that can hide himself from thy heat. I read and was set on fire. Augustine's single greatest work, I mean, in terms of, of size, is his Enerationes in Psalmos, Expositions of the Psalms, over 3,000 pages of commentary. This is more than twice the length of City of God. Augustine exhausted himself in explaining the Psalter to his people. And the expositions are mostly made up of transcriptions of his preaching, as Augustine worked out live in front of his congregation a method of reading the Psalms in reference to Christ. Augustine called this the totus Christus reading, the whole Christ. 
Christ the head, and we the body, his body, lifting up these words together in praise to the Father. Augustine writes, these are our words, and yet it is Christ that speaks. If they are our words, how is it Christ that speaks? Do you not know that love makes us one in Christ? Love cries to Christ from us. Love cries from Christ for us. You, says the apostle, are the body of Christ and its members. If then he is the head and we the body, it is one that speaks. Whether the head speaks or the members, it is one Christ that speaks. The whole Christ. I'd like to conclude this talk with a few specimens of how to employ this reading to understand some of the more difficult passages in the Psalter. And first, I want to take on the curses. <laughs> so I've asked Andrew Valenza to come up here and read one of the psalms that you never hear in the Liturgy of the Hours. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the sons of men uprightly? Nay, in your hearts you dis devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked go astray from the womb. They err from their birth, speaking lies. They have venom, like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. Like grass, let them be trodden down and wither. Let them be like the snail which dissolves into slime, like the untimely birth that never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks, God. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. So that is some strong medicine right there. I wonder, who are these enemies we're praying against? <coughs> Augustine has an answer for us. Who are these enemies? Let us see whether they are plainly described by any servant of the Lord, by any soldier now perfected who has engaged with them. Hear the apostle saying, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, as though to say, turn not your hatred against men. Do not think them your enemies, nor that it is by their hostility that you are being bruised. These men whom you fear are flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That is how Paul speaks, dismissing mortal men. Against whom then do we wrestle? against principalities, says he, and powers, and the rulers of this world of darkness. Read in the light of Christ, we are not hurling these curses against our mortal enemies. These are Christ's words, and Christ died also for those who persecute us. We pray the imprecatory psalms against Christ's enemies, Satan and his demons, the Psalter is our battle hymn in the spiritual warfare of the Church. Next we've got an even more difficult problem. And so I called in a real expert, Miss Maddie Horvath, <laughs> to read for us Psalm 18.
I love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of perdition assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord, to my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering around him, his canopy thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him there broke through his clouds hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Then he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He reached from on high, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. Then they came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and his statues I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> Was anybody else getting a little uncomfortable toward the end of that reading? Um, verse 23. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. Can we really pray that? <laughs> if I mean, maybe Maddie can get away with that. <laughs> but I uh, <laughs> If you're like me and have a, a pretty healthy estimation uh, of your own sinfulness, how can you possibly make these words your own? I would suggest this is one of the portions of the Psalter where Augustine's totus Christus method really moves the freight. Because the one human being ever to live who could speak those words, I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt. The one human being who could ever speak these words full-throated is Jesus Christ. In this instance, the head speaks for the body and carries the body with it. We can lay claim to these words only in as much as we are in Christ and participate in his righteousness, his victory over sin and death. Lee? One final example, and uh, here's a real curveball. I've asked my friend uh, Lee Strong to come up and read yeah. Psalm 38. Obviously, he was looking for a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> o Lord, rebuke me not in thy anger, nor chasten me in thy wrath. For the arrows have sunk into me, and thy hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thy indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. They weigh like a burden too heavy for me. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. Prost prostrate, excuse me. All the day I go about mourning. 
for my loins are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am utterly spent and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Lord, all my longing is known to thee. My sighing is not hidden from thee. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it also is gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all the day long. But I am like a deaf man, I do not hear, like a dumb man who does not open his mouth. Yea, I am like a man who does not hear and whose mouth are no rebukes. But for thee, O Lord, do I wait. It is thou, O Lord my God, who wilt answer. For I pray, only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. Those who are my foes without cause are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good are my adversaries because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. We know that Christ is the suffering servant, afflicted for our tr transgressions, uh, the man of grief acquainted with sorrow. But what about what we heard, just heard there in verse 4? For my iniquities have gone over my head, they weigh like a burden too heavy for me. Or verse 18, I confess my iniquity, I am sorry for my sin. How can Christ say this? St. Augustine also saw the problem, and I quote, If Christ is in very truth without sin and without transgression, we begin to doubt whether these words of the psalm can be his. What are these sins, I ask, if not sins of his body, the church? For here the body is speaking as well as the head. How do they speak as one person? Because they shall be, he says, two in one flesh. This is a great sacrament, says the Apostle, but I speak of Christ and of the Church. We must listen as to one person speaking, but the head as head and the body as body. We are not separating two persons, but drawing a distinction in dignity. The head saves, the body is saved. The head must show mercy, the body bewails its misery. The office of the head is the purgation of sins, that of the body, the confession of them. Yet there is but one voice, and no written instruction to inform us when the body speaks and when the head. We can tell the difference as we listen, but he speaks as one individual. So when the psalmist declares, I was blameless before him, it is Christ the head who speaks, and we participate in his righteousness. But when the psalmist prays, I am sorry for my sin, it is we the body who pray, while Christ comes alongside to comfort us in our affliction. This is the totus Christus method. This is how I have learned to pray the whole Psalter and have the joy of it. Let me say in conclusion, at the beginning of the talk, when I said that God wrote the book of Psalms with a mind to making us human, I was only telling part of the story. God wrote the Psalter to make us resemble one human in particular. And so I'll give the last word to C.S. Lewis. The moment you realize, here I am, dressing up as Christ, it is extremely likely that you will see at once some way in which, at that very moment, the pretense could be made less of a pretense and more of a reality. You see what is happening. The Christ himself, the Son of God, who is man, just like you, and God, just like his Father, 
is actually at your side and is already at that moment beginning to turn your pretense into a reality. The real Son of God is at your side. He is beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself. Thank you. <laughs>